Hello, welcome to the episode of the Let People Prosper series. My name is Dr. Vance Ginn. I hope you're having a prosperous today. We're recording on December 14, 2022, episode 23, with a another freedom fighter and a happy warrior, someone who's always pushing the envelope um, to keep you on your toes, to make sure that you're looking at these things from an economic perspective, looking at opportunity cost, um, and, and really hitting the key button items, whether it be trade, whether it be the worker, whether it be immigration, just a lot of key issues to talk about. About. Um, and it's another, none other than Scott Lincecum. Hey, Scott, how's it going? Hey, doing well, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be with you today. I'm really looking forward to our discussion. Um, you got a great book that's coming out tomorrow. So this is great timing, given our release of this, whenever this video will be aired. For the audience, I want to go ahead and go through your bio first, and then we can dive right in. So Scott Linscombe is the Director of General Economics and Cato's Herbert A. Stifel Center for Trade Policy Studies. He writes on international and domestic economic issues, including international trade, subsidies, and industrial policy, manufacturing and global supply chains, and economic dynamism. Linscombe also is a senior visiting lecturer at Duke University Law School, where he has taught a course on international trade law, and he previously taught international trade policy as a visiting lecturer at Duke. Prior to joining Cato, Lincecum spent two decades practicing international law, uh, trade law at White, White and Case LLP, where he litigated national and multilateral trade disputes and advised multinational corporations on how to optimize their transactions and business practices uh, consistent with global trade rules, and national regulations. From 1998 to 2001, Linscombe was a trade policy research assistant at Cato. He became an adjunct scholar in 2013. During that time, Linscombe authored or co-authored several pa policy papers, as well as numerous op-eds on trade and economic issues, which he recently had out on December 8th, the Wall Great Wall Street Journal article that everybody should check out. And I'll put in the show notes page as well. Um, he is routinely featured on TV, radio, and print media. Uh, Linscombe has a BA in political science from the University of Virginia and a JD from the university's School of Law. So, Scott, the first question um, that I ask all of the, yeah. the, the folks who come on is, what motivates you? What really gets you excited to do the things that you do each and every day? Well, sure. Uh, I mean, it's really two big motivations. Uh, you know, the first is uh, I have really always been uh, kind of anti-bully and anti-protection. And so from a young age, I've always, you know, really been interested and motivated to push back on a lot of, in the government sphere, you know, a lot of the cronyism and a lot of the uh, bullying that goes down in American policy. You know, whether it's nimbyism in housing or protectionism in trade or uh, various other types of, you know, regulatory or interstate protectionism, things like occupational licensing, you know, when we say protectionism, doesn't mean always have to be international. That stuff always rankles me. So I and I take it kind of personally because in the end of the day, it ends up hurting the little guy a lot more than the big guy. The little guy doesn't have the money and resources to lobby Washington and get all these special uh, benefits. So so that's the first thing. Uh, but the second thing is that um, you know throughout my life and throughout working at Cato and being involved in international trade stuff for years, I mean, I've seen firsthand uh, over and over and over the benefits of open markets and free markets that free people allowed to do uh, the things they want to do tend to produce pretty great outcomes. You know, nothing's perfect. There's no utopia out there. But in general, if the state gets out of the way, uh, if individuals are allowed to pursue their wants and desires and dreams and all that stuff, if markets are allowed to properly function, you know, there are good things happen. And, and I've seen it so much, whether it's, you know, here in the United States or in some developing country abroad, you know, these, these things really, really matter. And particularly when you go to a developing country and you realize just how wonderful it is to be an American, given the abundance we have, the freedoms we have, all that stuff is really, really awesome. And it produces awesome results. So, you know, you combine those two things together, it, 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 it's what gets me up every day. Yeah, no, I love that. That's awesome. You know, mine is let people prosper. So it goes into a lot of those issues you just discussed as well. From your background and, and, and going to law school and you're a lawyer, what got you into economics? What, what were yeah. some of the key readings in economics that got you this sort of a uh, line of thinking? Yeah, I mean, it came through the trade space, you know, as a research assistant in Cato's Trade Center a, a billion years ago. Um, I wasn't really into e economics at all. 
Uh, you know, yeah. I'm a political science major. I thought I wanted to do constitutional law for some of the same reasons I just mentioned. Um, you know, I, I always kind of had this innate interest in promoting liberty and freedom and all that jazz. But when I started working in the trade center, I realized uh, how important the economic side of it is. And in fact, I remember sitting as an intern before working in the trade center and hearing about the trade deficit and economic growth and how everything I had ever read was wrong, basically about all this stuff. You know, I kind of had that light bulb moment, right? And then yeah. um, from there, it was realizing that I think the trade story is just a small part of all of it. You know, that when you talk about trade stuff, you're actually talking about labor policy and tax policy and regulatory policy and all sorts of economic concepts. You know, you mentioned opportunity costs, unintended consequences, uh, dead weight loss, all these types of things that um, are have a really fundamental economic principles, um, but are caught up in the, in the trade debate. So what really kind of got me going? Well, back then, you know, again, you know, quite frankly, it's kind of funny to say, but uh, Paul Krugman, back when Paul yeah. Krugman was at MIT, Paul Krugman was amazing on trade stuff. I mean, really, truly, uh, one of the few people uh, in the 90s, at least, who wrote coherently on these issues from an economic perspective, but one that was digestible. And then, you know, others like Milton Friedman, you know, is an obvious choice, right? You know, the, the old video series, I still look at these videos that on YouTube, and the uh, Friedman's ability to take complex issues and distill them down into really beautiful little sound bites. It's still like I look at it and I'm like, God, oh, that's so good. You know, and now I'm going to I'm going to copy it. You, you know, here it is 50 years later. Right. So, um, you know, and then from there, uh, the usual, you know, kind of I, I hate to be boring, but the usual suspects, you know, Bastiat and Smith and, and some of the newer guys, though, like. Uh, Jagdish Bhagwati, who's written a lot about globalization and and, and uh, poor nations development, um, all those things kind of have have really um, have influenced me as well. No, definitely. Um, what's interesting, you brought up Paul Krugman. I don't think most people would expect us to, to say positive things, but I think you're right. I mean, I learned a lot about international trade from Paul Krugman, and it's that's the reason why he got the Nobel Prize. Now, yeah. he's used it in a and different he, way. If, if for those listening, if you Google Krugman MIT columns or whatever, because he used to write, I think, in Slate magazine, if that's even still a thing. But anyway, they were he really had and still has, quite frankly, a, a, a impressive ability to take economic concepts and, and make them digestible for normal people. Now, of course, today, the Paul Krugman of today is very different from that Paul Krugman, unfortunately. But yeah. I, I think he's still, you know, I, I was reading something just yesterday, a column on Biden trade stuff, and I didn't agree with most of it because, again, it kind of now pretty partisan. But he's very talented at the ability to take these concepts and, and put them in what I would call op-ed form, which, you know, is hard. Uh, one of the things I love about having my own column at the dispatch is I don't have any word limits. So I just cranked out 3,000 words, and hey, that's what I was going to be. But 800 words is a totally different thing. Uh, and, you know, there are some people out there who who really do have a talent for it. No, I think that's right. And um, I think you do a good job. So keep writing those. <laughs> I enjoy reading them. And, you know, and, and Milton Friedman, of course, I watch a lot of those as well. You know, the, the Free to Choose series, I will still go back and watch those series. And the debates that they had at the end of those with Thomas Sowell was on there and, yeah. and others. I mean, it's just a phenomenal thing. I even go back and watch the lectures that he gives. You can look, read it. You can listen to his lecture series, and I'll I'll watch those sometimes at night when the kids are asleep and the wife's asleep. Uh, that, that's how I relax, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, the guy really had a preternatural ability to communicate in, in ways that it even today it's incredible. You know, I was just watching the Donahue interview. Oh. which, by the way, if only we could have a forty-five minute televised discussion with a, a leading free market economist today. I mean, good, good luck. Right? Oh my goodness. But, yeah. But, you know, and, and the ability to immediately answer the questions in quick, smart responses. It's, it's, uh, it's brilliant. And, and not a lot of jargon. It's no, right, in a way right. you can understand, you know, and um, exactly. anyway, I, I think I think you're right about all that. And that makes a lot of sense. You know, someone else that's in this space on economic development and everything else is Douglas North, who sure. I've, I've really started to like a lot more. And um, I, I kind of 
pick off some Austrian school economics some Chicago school and some institutional economics is, is kind of and public, and public choice. James Buchanan yeah, sure. is probably a good, well-rounded the way of my thinking in economics. But, yeah. you know, I, I followed a lot of your work over time and we've known each other for a while. Um, and it, you know, the, your your way of explaining things in trade are also along those lines of just easy to understand. And, and for yeah. the audience, you know, Cato is a 501c3, uh, more libertarian, right, um, overall, more classical liberal thinking right. in a lot of ways and that, that, I, that I have as well. And so I think you're able to do that in a, in a really well way. What are the key things, you know, kind of diving in now with trade, which is something yeah. that can be so confrontational, especially today and as you know, I worked in the Trump White House where that was um, there was a lot of confrontations with, you know, sure. um, Peter Navarro and, and uh, Lighthouser and others who, who saw things a much different way. Yeah. You know, um, how would you best make the case for, you know, free trade? Sure. Well, you know, I think people misunderstand uh, what trade is. Um, mm. And I think this goes into the whole Lighthizer and Navarro conception of trade. Um, trade is not e economic exchanges between nations. It is actually voluntary transactions between individuals that just so happen to cross a border, a, a national border. If Bob wants to buy uh, a widget from Juan in Mexico, uh, that's, that is trade. Um, and it, ha it just so happens to occur millions and millions and millions of times every day. It is a very human thing. Um, people have been trading since essentially the dawn of recorded history. It is not this evil multinational plan for corporations or, or governments or whatever. Now, look, governments are involved. Um, at certain places, whether they own an, a company or they're regulating or subsidizing. But again, trade at the end of the day is a fundamentally individual and human uh, endeavor. And well, protectionism, by contrast, is when the government gets in between that transaction. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I want people to focus more on that, on that protectionism is the unnatural thing here. A tariff a uh, blockade of some sort, an import ban, whatever. That's the government getting in between you and your retailer, your wholesaler, or whatever. Um, you know, I think conservatives, free marketers recoil at this concept so much when government is getting in between, say, them and their doctors, getting in between them and somebody across a state border. But when you throw a national border in, suddenly everything changes. Suddenly it's us versus them, it's America versus China and the rest of it, right? So I think the first thing that's that's critical is to note that you know protectionism is the is the outlier. It is the unnatural state. Uh, and it is the government interfering in those transactions. So from there, the next step is to look at, well, why do we engage in trade? Um, we engage in trade to, to better ourselves, better our families, to, to consume goods and services um, with the fruits of our own labor. Um, and that gets into things like specialization. You know, we don't all make our own clothes or grow our own food. I grow a little bit of food for fun, but I would never try to live off of it. So that's the next thing is to look at, well, why do we trade and what does trade do? Trade tends to make us better off than we would be if we tried to do everything ourselves. So that's, I think, another critical concept. We trade to better ourselves. The third thing that I think is, is critical is that we need to look at, well, why does government implement protectionism? Well, government says that's going to be pro-worker. We'll get to that in a bit, or, or national security. But look, this is government we're talking about, right? So we need to be uh, very skeptical, just as we're skeptical of government interfering in all those other transactions I mentioned. We need to have our, you know, uh, a magnifying glass to look at, at why that's the case. We need to look at the consequences of that interference. Um, and, and when you start doing that, you start to see that most protections, not all, even Milton Friedman and others have seen said that protectionism can be justified on, say, national security grounds. But the vast majority of protectionism out there uh, turns out to be politically motivated. You know, the big dairy lobby came out and lobbied for tariffs on baby formula. And for those listening, that's literally happening right now. Uh, the steel industry lobbies for tariffs on steel. Throughout 
American history. I mean, you go back to the 1800s, U.S. tariff policy was very much a very about cronyism, political connections, not about some sort of broad national interest or national security. So, you know, usually when you scratch protectionism, you find some cronies underneath. Um, Second is you need to look at, well, what are the effects of that protectionism? And you see that first, protectionism harms consumers, mostly low-income American consumers. The hardest hit people by, you know, the people hardest hit by baby formula tariffs are poor consumers that, you know, have smaller budgets, less disposable income, have to pay higher prices and the rest. And we have tariffs on footwear, we have tariffs on clothing, all these things that American families need every day. If you have kids, you know, you need them a couple times every year. Unfortunately, those kids never stop growing. You know, that those raise costs. But also American companies are also consumers. So when you slap tariffs on steel, well, you harm uh, automakers in the United States and thus all of their workers. So protectionism, when you start digging into this, turns out to be a very bad economic deal. Uh, it hurts not only consumers, it's not only about cheap TVs at Walmart, but it hurts American companies, it hurts the people who are working in, at the ports or in commercial trucking and all these jobs. And it ends up being a net loss for the economy overall. So, you know, you combine all that together, and I think that the case for free trade is very, very strong, that uh, there you can have discrete exceptions for security-related issues. You can have kind of unique and weird issues um, related to state-owned enterprises or uh, really troubling things like slave labor abroad. That's not voluntary. But in general, free trade is good, freer trade is better, and uh, that, and we should be highly, highly skeptical of government efforts to restrict trade for for various you know reasons, public interest reasons. No, well said. I think that's that's a great way to put it. Uh, some of the things that came to mind were, you know, the the knowledge problem, of course, from Hayek. Yeah. The government doesn't have enough knowledge to know what all the resources are that should go across. Um, Adam Smith's you know, uh, absolute advantage and David Ricardo's comparative advantage, those sort of things that should be considered as well. And, and, and look, you know, I, I don't put in my own ceiling fans at our house. Yeah. I don't want to learn how to do that. I don't have any interest in doing that. My opportunity cost is too high that I want to do something else. I think that's a great way to put it is that we do trade every day. I mean, yeah. economics is really the study of human action and inter interaction to satisfy our desires, you know, within institutions, um, within these scarce resources that we have. So how do we best use those to the high highest valued consumer and highest valued producer. Yeah. And we, we, you're exactly right. Like we don't worry about this between states, somebody coming in and out, uh, but across the country, oh my goodness, the world, the world's right. going to end somehow. Yeah. And, and I think that the other thing that's really critical is even where you have legitimate concerns about things like great power competition between the United States and China. Yeah. Uh, the next step is then to consider, well, is this an optimal policy? Even assuming, let's, let's, let's grant every assumption about China bad, China's military is a problem, blah, blah, blah. Well, is uh, making our companies and workers poor actually uh, a good thing? And, you know, certainly, again, exceptions, we're not going to be uh, is sending nuclear weapons technologies right. and whatever to the Chinese government. But just banning T-shirts from China, making Americans pay more for that or, or other things, does that really make us stronger? Or does that interconnectedness maybe help in geopolitical terms? Because you know, research shows it does. So you yeah. always have to think beyond the first step to the second, is, and that is, does this policy actually make us better off in the short or long term? And Almost always with protectionism, the answer is no. I agree. And one of the things that I kept trying to promote you know, within the White House and otherwise is, look, if, if China, like you said earlier, let's assume that China is a threat and there's some major issues. I don't like the way that a lot of stuff is run there. It's too socialist, too communistic and everything else. But by putting tariffs on them, it's going to end up hurting Americans, low-income yeah. Americans the most, and we're just going to shift to other countries. So instead, yeah. why don't we go to the more free trade agreement route, like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which yeah. I think may have been a bad decision, but you know, the terms of agreement from the, the Obama administration were bad. And I was always arguing, well, if the Trump administration, maybe we should renegotiate, or but, yeah, but right. we should find ways to trade more with those partners. Um, and, and that way we can benefit over time. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, and this and this goes back to why, again, why I wanted to move beyond trade in, in my career, yeah. because there are so many other policies to pursue that can boost American manufacturing, boost American competitiveness, uh, help vis-a-vis -vis China, you name it. 
um, that have nothing really to do with trade. Um, you know, manufacture, you know, tax policy, for yes. example, uh, whether it's full expensing for investment or lowering corporate taxes or whatever. Immigration policy. You know, we're we're subsidizing the heck out of semiconductors these days, and yet we have still have restrictions on the talent that these new facilities need to actually produce semiconductors, because a lot of the semiconductor industry relies on high-skill immigrants, right? So you've mentioned free trade agreements with, with allies, uh, liberalizing imports of, of manufacturing inputs. You can go on and on and on. And, and so that, again, the, the problem with protectionism usually is that it actually is a net, it makes us worse off, and it ignores that there are all these other alternative policies that can make us better off. And yeah. so uh, it's essential when you're thinking about these things to, um, again, take the next step. Yep, that's right. And, and a lot, there's a lot of talk about trade deficits. Uh, that, <laughs> and, and there's a lot of focus on that. You know, we've got a trade deficit, right. so we must not be prospering in America. We're benefiting yeah. others in the process. And they don't look at, that's a Current account, or you know, a current account versus a yeah. capital account. Capital current account is the trade of goods and services that you have a, a deficit, but you have a capital account surplus where there's a flow of financial income that's coming back into the yeah. United States that expands the economy and supports job creation and growth and everything else. And you know, there's there's opportunities to build elsewhere or use workers elsewhere where they can also prosper. And if they're prospering, yeah. they consume more from you in the process. So there's kind of this right. cyclical ability for the economy to grow and for people to be better off of overall you know one of the yeah. you know free markets is really getting a bad rap a lot of a lot of times nowadays and yeah. i've been trying to change that um twitter's probably not the best place to do it but in a lot of my writings and everything i've been calling it you know free markets are really just free people it, right. the market is nothing but people and the more that we try to go against the free market i think we're people are really just wanting more control of people and another yeah. you, know, you see that within trade but also within the american worker i want to get into that here in just a minute but go ahead and respond you know and i think the other thing that uh, one of the reasons why trade gets a bad rap other than classic biases, you know, we tend to be biased against foreigners and this kind of stuff, is that, you know, increasingly in our political space, disruption is considered a bad thing, right? You know, uh, particularly on the right these days, you know, now it is, it is the, this disruption, you know, we're only looking at the disruption. We're only looking at the losers of the disruption. We're not looking at the benefits of disruption. And this is all about free markets in general, right? So, you know, trade gets this um, a oddly bad rap because this is all forms of market competition produce disruption. They produce people who don't get that sale. If you have two gas stations across the street from each other, you patronize one gas station. Well, you're not patronizing the other. That other is a lo loser. But that competition between those two, your ability to have your dollars pick winners and losers and millions and millions of Americans picking those things, that's a really, really important part of uh, our economy. And it produces not just cheap t-shirts, but it produces all these cool, once unimaginable innovations that really uh, trade is just a part of. And I think it's critical for us as, as free marketers to embrace disruption, right? To say, this is a good thing. We are they have government protecting you from cradle to grave. Um, keeping you in the same job for 50 years. I mean, that sounds great, right? But at the end of the day, that makes you poor, that makes the nation poor, and uh, it makes you know your kids and your grandkids poor too. And we have to always remember that, yeah, disruption is scary, job loss, nobody wants to lose a job, uh, but those are the types of things that are essential to a functioning market economy. Uh, you know, in fact, it was, uh, I think it was in the Friedman Donahue uh, video from the other day that, you know, Friedman said, yes, uh, winner, winning companies are great, but it's actually the failures that matter the most. It's that fear of failure and the failures themselves that is a part of that teaching process to motivate people to innovate and improve um, and to have people kind of move up the, the, the economic ladder. Um, yeah. And we, again, we, we, these days, especially in Washington, on both sides of the aisle, um, heaven forbid that, you know, things might get a little scary or precarious out there every once in a while. Heaven forbid, you know, um, that there might be 
some uncertainty and disruption. Uh, no, no, we're gonna we're gonna protect all of that. You know, we're gonna mandate your benefits. We're gonna we're gonna keep you, like I said, in the same job, uh, whether it's tariff protection or whatever. Um, leaving aside that that makes us actually worse off in the long run. And, and even on our personal lives, right? I mean, and the failures that I've had have helped me to learn. <laughs> Sure. to be better off. And I, and I made a lot, especially in my late teenage years as a drummer in a rock band and everything else. I mean, there was a lot of stuff that was going on. Um, but I learned from those issues and, 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 and move along. And in our economy and in our economy, of course, it's just people. The people need to learn. And we, we need to be able to take those failures and take those successes. Yeah. It's one of the big things about the profit and loss system and the system of capitalism yeah. is there's going to be profit, but there's going to be losses. And when you have those losses, you can overcome them somehow because you improve, you innovate, you you do other things that allows you to be profitable in the long run, or you're not going to last in that business very long. Right. Um, and, and with all this, and I think it's great to start off with trade because trade, like you said, really is with individuals and then going into workers. One right. of the things that I've seen is within the populism movement, the national conservative movement, is that I think they're identifying a lot of the problems that are there within the rust belt there was a lot of issues that were going on right when you see that people may, maybe wages aren't keeping up with inflation um when people are losing their jobs in certain areas there's there's a lot of strife that a lot of families are feeling right now throughout the economy and what their solution or other solutions and a lot of progressives as well is that we need government to come in and solve the right. problem but one of the things you know scott that i think within the the book and then this wall street journal piece you had out recently america's workers need freedom not more government but the book which comes out tomorrow uh, empowering the new american worker market-based solutions for today's workforce which has a number of chapters on a lot of key areas um, occupational licensing being one independent workers um, criminal justice I think is a big one, remote work, employee benefits. I mean, welfare reform, I mean, this has got everything in it. Um, I've read a lot of the chapters that have, have been provided online. I can't wait to read the whole book. But I, I think what would be your big perspective, kind of overarching from the book that you would want to get across to, to the audience? Yeah, I, I mean, there's a, a, a few things. The, the first is that, yes, uh, there are <clears throat> real issues with the American workforce. There are, uh, things aren't as bad. It's not the gloom and doom you might hear, right? Uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it gets kind of hysterical out there. But sure, there are issues with specific communities or individuals' ability to move from place to place or job to job. Um, there, uh, you know, there are issues with, say, um, you know, prime age male labor force participation and these types of things. But uh, there are really a few really critical things. First is that it's essential that we acknowledge that we do not live in some sort of free market labor utopia, right? Uh, and I think that's a huge fundamental misunderstanding um, that as detailed in the book, over the last 30 years of all this disruption, governments at the state, local, and federal level have been increasingly putting up barriers to workers' mobility, to workers' independence and autonomy. Uh, they have been raising the prices of essential goods and services like childcare and healthcare and clothing and food. Um, these policies have been making it harder for uh, us to adjust when shocks of any sort happen. And then, you know, again, this goes kind of back to trade a little bit. Trade, you know, the trade shocks, the China shock, always blame. But look, shots are inevitable, whether it's trade with China or trade with South Carolina, or whether it's uh, a new innovation that puts, you know, uh, camera producers out of business, right? Because we don't all we don't have cameras anymore. Um, right. Those types of disruptions are inevitable. Uh, but government has been making it harder for us to adjust. So that's the first thing. Um, and pro-worker policy almost universally ignores all of these government policies that are hurting the American workforce. And then second, and very relatedly, um, we ignore how free market reforms of these policies and just common sense reforms. You know, not all of this is really about free markets. You know, a lot of it is. But for example, we just have really outdated, archaic rules on remote work. Um, because it, it didn't exist before. Um, yet a lot of Americans want to work remotely. Uh, it's good for local communities that it might have been struggling. It, there's, it's good for working parents. There's a lot of benefits. Well, tax policy hasn't kept up with that. But there are all these policy reforms 
um, that could be implemented that um, don't increase the scope of government, that make workers freer to do the things they want to do, that would uh, attack a lot of the same problems we're identifying. You know, um, by whether it's national conservatives or progressives or conservatives and libertarians, even right. Um, you know, one of the examples I talk about a lot is child tax credits, right? Um, it seems we have a big consensus on the left and the right that child tax credits are good. We need bigger child tax credits and all the rest. But if you look at what's discussed in the book, um, whether it is liberalizing tariffs on food and clothing and the and the rest, or uh, revo- reforming cafe regulations and the renewal fuel standard or liberalizing certain child care regulations that increase the cost of child care by thousands of dollars per year or implementing health care reforms that would put uh, dollars into Americans' pockets and allow markets to function better and provide better and lower cost services, on and on and on. You could dramatically improve the living standards of working families via these reforms instead of just throwing more taxpayer dollars at them, which, of course, inevitably is going to produce all sorts of distortions. Uh, And then the last thing that I think the book really tries to hit is that we really, especially in Washington, have a fundamental misunderstanding of who the American worker is, right? I mean, if you're going to listen to Joe Biden or Donald Trump or anybody else, the American worker is a white middle-aged dude in his, his 50s with a lunch pail, and he goes to an assembly line job in the Rust Belt every day. Or uh, maybe if you listen to Nancy Pelosi, it's a uh, urbanite, single college-educated female, or maybe she's cohabitating with a, a guy or another gal, um, and they demand more um, child care benefits or mandated paid leave and all that kind of stuff. So those are your two groups, right? you got the kind of yuppie urbanites and, and the lunch pal Joe. Totally ridiculously wrong, right? The vast majority of the American workforce is totally different from those stereotypes. I mean, there are people who do that, of course, but you know, most of us don't work in manufacturing. People are not abandoning cities, but they're moving to other places. Uh, the high cost coastal mega cities that we thought were going to dominate. Yeah, you know, they're struggling a bit. We're now moving to places. I'm in Raleigh, for example. You know, there's all sorts of other options out there. Um, and of course, we have this wide diversity of jobs, of priorities in our jobs. Maybe we don't want higher wages. Maybe we want a remote work option, or maybe um, we don't want a mandated paid leave. Maybe we just want more money. I mean, on and on and on, right? We have wildly diverse hopes and dreams and objectives and priorities. And thus, pro-worker policy shouldn't try to assume everybody is lunch pail Joe or whatever. Instead, it should do things to let people be who they want to be and let workers uh, have money in their pocket uh, and the ability to move from job to job or place to place and then pursue their own dreams. And, and we've seen that right during the pandemic. All of these things we thought we knew in 2019 have been proven wildly wrong. And and certainly that's going to change again. You know, 2022 ain't going to be what's what's cool or, or popular in 2028 or whatever. And and thus it's essential for policy to allow workers to adjust that so policy should emphasize portability, and flexibility and autonomy and all these types of things that, again, allow allow American workers to be the, the workers they want to be. And, and so that is, a I think, a huge theme throughout the book is I don't claim to know what the future of American work is, uh, not even five years from now, next year, I, I don't claim to know. But I do know that if we implemented a, a kind of uh, clear package of these policies, we'd be able to handle whatever comes next. Uh, By contrast, if we implement all these anti-market policies, all these policies that assume that everything is a market failure and we have to get government involved, uh, most likely, and based on oodles of economic research from the left and the right. You know, this is not just a libertarian economist thing. I mean, we we went out of our way to have a diversity of, of views and scholarly research. But this shows that those anti-market policies are most likely going to make us worse off. And it's not and it's still compassionate because I think sometimes we get a rap of as free market classical liberal libertarians that we're or not compassionate. We don't right. care about the poor or anything else. And it's like, well no, hold up a minute. We are compassionate. It's, it's that these 
policies, the, these, the free market is what actually helps them the most. Uh, yeah. The policies that you're trying to impose actually create disincentives to work, which is the best path to prosperity, right? All these other factors that don't let people prosper time mm-hmm. and again. Yeah, one of my one of my favorite news studies, which is quoted and cited in, in the book, is from a, a guy, a researcher, Nicholas Engbaum, who looked at labor market fluidity. Now, this is a very technical term, but it essentially means the ability of for workers to move from job to job. And found out that places that had more fluid and less protected labor markets, like the United States, actually ended up having workers that had higher earnings and more productivity. And this goes back to the idea that protecting workers with all these kind of European style labor regulations and the rest sounds compassionate. It sounds good, right? But at the end of the day, uh, again, per his research and lots of other research, uh, it actually makes workers worse off, poorer in the long run. And that's a hard concept to communicate, but it's, again, critically important if you really care about the, the the living standards of the American workforce and, and, and about, you know, our kids' living standards as well. And, you know, heck, even during the pandemic, uh, those types of principles have helped. Uh, you know, the there was a great piece in the Wall Street Journal a few months ago that showed that, again, European-style labor markets were suffering from more underemployment. They were having really pro- big problems with um, workers moving to new industries because, you know, the pandemic shut down entire industries, right? And that these sclerotic, protected European labor markets were actually struggling far more. Um, going back to the trade space, we saw in the baby formula crisis that um, baby formula, we make almost all baby formula in the United States. So almost 98% of all baby formula. Uh, in the United States in 2021 was made in the United States. We have all these tariff walls and regulations, all these Buy America rules and welfare rules and the rest. All the stuff that, again, if you're a if you're reading from the National Conservative Playbook, I mean, this is amazing, right? And here we've had the one of the longest, deepest, and most prolonged crises of the entire pandemic. Um, you and I were talking, you know, before we yeah. got on the air that you're still struggling with baby formula shortages. And I mean, that was that Abbott plant closed down like 10 months ago. And yet we still uh, don't have an, a, an operating market, a, a functioning market. And a lot of that is because of those trade barriers and regulatory pro, uh, over-regulation rest. And so, yes, it looks scary. It looks uh, cold-hearted. But the fact is that time and time and time again, it is those lighter regulated markets, those freer markets that perform better, uh, not just in the good times, but in the bad times too. Uh, well put, well said there. And you're right, we are still facing some of those issues with the baby formula shortage. And you know the, the shortage is if you don't have a proper functioning market, a well-functioning right. price system that directs those resources, you run into these shortage problems, which can be uh, dire for a lot of people. Fortunately, yeah. we've been able to find some here and there and some family members have helped to send us more from across the nation really but not everybody's going to be in that situation and yeah. we shouldn't have to be it, you know a lot yeah. of the government problems have led to the situation that we're in and so then adding more government to try to solve the problem will just exacerbate the situation right. and we've fallen into that trap for too long um right. as we're wrapping up here scott and it's been a great discussion what would be your final remarks to uh, to the audience about the book or anything else that you want to put out there? I mean, aside from click on the link, read the book, buy the book, right. it's a hard copy for you, your relatives, and any member of Congress that you might know. I think the, the really key takeaway uh, from the book is that when you hear the term market failure, or you hear that markets have failed distinct classes of workers, it is really essential to scratch beneath the surface and look at what is really going on in that market. And again, to look at the government policies that might be actually making things a lot worse, often under the guise of uh, pro-worker policy. Uh, Because time and time and time again, It turns out that it is all those government policies that are really causing the problems. And then I think the big takeaway here is, look, um, this is not a recipe for anarcho-capitalism, right? I am not saying, oh, we need no government, we need no regulation. Um, But it is saying, look, if we're going to enact some sort of uh, pro-worker reform package, we need to start by reforming those government policies, implementing market-oriented and common-sense reforms, 
And then let's have a legitimate discussion about where uh, there might be a legitimate market failure. Maybe there is a need for a child allowance or child tax credit, but it sure as heck can't be now when we're making child care thousands of dollars more expensive than it needs to be, um, or making footwear and clothing and the rest more expensive, or blocking baby formula or, or the rest, right? Um, until we make those reforms, we can't possibly know where the market failure bodies are buried. Um, and thus, we most likely are risking making things worse. Um, you know, subsidizing demand while restricting supply, well, that's even higher prices, right? Uh, so we, we risk making things worse um, without uh, doing those kind of common sense first steps. Yep. Yep. Well, Scott, I look forward to reading the rest of the book. Um, I'll definitely have that in the show notes page, advancedagain.substack.com. Um, and it's been a pleasure talking with you today, Scott. Mm -hmm. Keep up the good work. Um, and for the audience, if you like this episode, please go and rank, rate us a five star uh, and subscribe as well. Um, please go check out Scott Linscombe as well on Twitter and uh, Cato. Um, just a great overall guy. I think you'll really like what he has to say and, and write about. Um, and otherwise, hope you have a great day and let people prosper. Yeah.